Hi everyone, and welcome to another edition of Creative Current here at LA Art Streams. I'm your host, Shane Anise Dambrot, here in the studio of downtown painter Jim Morthesis. Hi, Jim. Hi, Shana. Thanks for having us in today. It's my pleasure. And, uh, well, I, you know, I guess we might as well just jump right into the new work because that was the reason that we thought of speaking with you now as you're getting ready for a solo show at the end of January at Garbugian Gallery in Beverly Hills. But uh, it, the work is still here in the studio, so we had a kind of a rare opportunity to get a little preview up yeah. close of the new work. So I definitely would like to start with that, and then maybe we can go back and kind of put them in context. Okay. Because these... Uh, are incredibly beautiful, very rich, very symbolic work, and there's things about it that make it obviously your, you know, your painting, like the way that it's done. And yet, there's also a lot about this show that is different from what yeah, you've done before. It is. So uh, we're speaking now about the Rose series, which probably the audience by now has seen a few uh, images of, so they're they're caught up. They know what we're talking about. If you could just describe what's going to be in the show, because I know the numbers and dimensions and kinds of things like that are as important almost as the paintings themselves. Well, it's a different show for me. I've never done one quite like this. All of the paintings on panel are the same size. And not 26 a huge inches size. square. 26? Martin... Well, I used to say tiny size. Well, They've now grown to moderate because they take so darn long, but 26 inches square which for on you wood panel is, is kind of itty-bitty. Small. I mean, people it's think to Morphesis, it's this big, muscular, crazy work, and these are much I've had smaller, to, much tighter. I've had to rein it in. So the muscular part is in the petals. <laughs> yes. So they're supposed to look like flesh. They are. Heavy they're very fleshy. Petals that are very fleshy, mm -hmm. muscular, wrinkled, and weigh a lot more, and seen a lot more time than an actual you know, petal, you know, mm -hmm. years instead of just days. So th they're different that way, and they're the pain in the neck to do. So I have to start I off. I love like you talk about it like it's not up to you. I had to rein it in. They're just different. <laughs> <laughs> like it had nothing to do well, with Well, you know, I all. think what happens is that it starts, you find something in your work that leads to something else, to, to something else. But then at some point, when I was doing these, they were a little too loose, a little too playful. And uh, I could either go more abstract, in which case I'd lose the rose image. You can't get too loose with them. Otherwise, it just ends up to be a blob. And these were an important memento mori image for me. Uh, you know, the rose. I, I been doing crucifixes and skulls and even bleeding hearts. So this was something a little different. In some way, they were more accessible, and that's something I wanted. Um, but they still very much fit into that kind of I think symbolism so, yeah. that people feel like they know to expect from you, which is, like you were talking about, which is heavily religious and very sort of tragic and operatic and it's, very symbolic. It's very operatic. You know, all of that stuff, but the rose, I mean, especially the sort of red rose and all that, is definitely, you can easily see how that would sort of fit into that continuum. But why did you, what was the thing with starting to work with the rose? What was the moment? It's, you know, I've used it on and off. Even when I did these large, uh, you know, see them in the corner of the studio, these uh, sides of beef, which were very abstracted, rose images and floral images started to just emerge. So it kept telling me they were there. But I, I re it also was a conscious decision to come up with a memento mori image that was accessible, immediately recognizable. It's a rose. Mm -hmm. It sucks you in. You think you know what it is. But I wanted them to be very intense, beautiful, but then distorted. Disturbing. They are. And the more you look, the more dis thank, thank you. Good. That's good. The more disturbing they get. Uh, and that's also why I use, for the first time since the mid 70s, a square format. Because mm -hmm. I wanted them to kind of feel like a target. I wanted, okay. you to be, I wanted them to be jammed right into the picture plane, and once you're there, you can't quite get out. Yeah, they really are. They have a feeling of, you know, there's some, a little bit of cropping, just enough to let you know that it's a sort of an artificial boundary the square towards the edge they get like, looser I, I think you know towards the center you can't lose the rose image you can't get too loose with it so i start off very slowly painstakingly rendering those great little folds within and as the rose opens up they become looser and tougher and they start to dissolve as they l sort of literally do yeah i, I kind of see I mean, it towards you know, the kind of what happens, right? They start yeah, up exactly, yeah, and then they, exactly. And then at a certain point, it goes past this fullness, and they start, and it starts to kind of disintegrate. And then they're off into what you don't know, 
and towards the center it's more about what you do know even technically you know how to paint it when you're talking about painting and building it up i'm also from my vantage point here i'm looking at the side and i can see which is nice in these because of the panel and the way that that works all of the colors that you don't see and you know that you don't know you're seeing in the finished object. So I'm looking at this. I'm looking at these, you know, these reds and fuchsias and this blood orange. But along the edges, where you let it bleed through, you see that there's underpainting. That's this very bright green and these fluorescent colors. Yeah. And so as you're making the image, you know, what in other words. Do you build up the, the the colors, the image at the same? Are you doing it all at the same time? Is it just a, a is it just a ground? Is that like, you know, how does how does they, that work? It really does happen at the same time. But right. you're right. In the beginning, actually, these start off with luminous colors, uh, spray enamel. Nice. And then I also start to work these. These, in some ways, these are really traditional. I build the surfaces up with uh, tempera paint and often a luminous temper paint and a permanent temper. There's a new acry acrylic gouache, you know, that I use. It's permanent, but it stays very flat, looks just like wash. Okay. And these strange luminous pinks and reds and yeah, greens. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing. And, and so that really is sort of partly responsible for the effect that you get. Yeah, it is because it. I then glaze oil on top of it. So it's, you know, back to the time of just post Botticelli uh, when, and through when the, uh, the glazes. They didn't amazing acrylic gouache to work with. They had beautiful colors with their gouache, but no, it didn't, it didn't glow quite the same way. So when I glaze the colors on, some of that comes through and in areas of the paint has kind of created you know, a strange kind of glow to them. So that's, and at the same time, it's creating this surface that's really Really rough and kind of variable and kind of a little bit has a little bit yeah. of mass to it. It's not really impasto. It is, but not really because for it, these paintings, you know, it kind of builds up. But I have yeah. to get thicker, and they, you know, because they're paintings, right? Um, you know, they're not you know illustrations of roses. Sure, they look that way, but to me, I consider myself an abstract painter, even though I always deal with with the figure. Um, so we'll figures are very that. important. As a matter of fact, <laughs> these were encouraged by a figurative painting. You're talking about opera. Yeah. Um, there's a Caravaggio painting, Doubting Thomas. Yes, there. Where yeah. Thomas is sticking his finger right in Christ's in wound, wound right? yeah. lifting the skin up like a petal. So that was the encouragement. And the liquids that you see seeping out in one yeah, or two drops, drops, drops only lips. really kind of come from that. It's like a serum, serum. <laughs> they're not blood, quite blood, but they're not a dew okay. drop. They're, they're a fluid, a, <laughs> right. a, fluid, yeah. a plasma. That's good. That's what you just said. Oh, I said better. Fluid. Yes, that's like all right. But so, okay, so the, I just I wanted to get into the technical a little bit because you were talking about how labor intensive they are and how ironic it is because they're smaller but much intense, more intensive and sort of time consuming yeah. than work that's much larger but that's much more raw and expressive. And when you, you get your whole body into it, it just, it, it, time wise, it just, it operates really differently. So are you kind of ready to get back to that? Yeah. <laughs> no, I like do, doing these, but the, actually the later ones are getting a little bit looser like and thicker towards the edges, so I just had a big panel made up. So these, how will these, this is a size that really feels like an icon. That was important. Like an icon as in sort of Russian religious icon that we think of. Well, I'm Greek, red so square. let's go Greek. Really. <laughs> I was thinking about Malevich with the red square. The icon, Which is very good. Totally it's all about the same, Greek and it's, it's Eastern Orthodox. Eastern, it's all the same Una, stuff. Facha, Una, Ratsa, right? Their, their churches say, had more domes. Okay. That's really right. the only difference. I'm Jewish. I'm just I'm just kind of guessing. Well, see, about but no, no, you actually actually understand all of this. But in that, when you say yeah. icon, you mean in that religious in context, that, yes, yeah. or, you know. Yeah. And of course, the rose, as I remember from art history, not from Hebrew school, is a hugely it's a hugely invested symbol in. Christianity in general, and especially like the older yeah. forms, the like Catholicism and the Orthodox, right? Yes, and I, I, absolutely. And and so that's sort of on your mind also, like this, because you've worked with religious iconography before, Pietà most notably. Then you look at the skulls and things, and that's maybe a little bit more 
maybe a little bit more folkloric, but still, there's that whole Golgotha thing with the first sure. skull, the blood of yeah. Christ ran down and hit Adam's skull or something like that. I remember this from art history, so I'm probably getting it wrong. But it, there's no, all but that. it's all there. All I mean, everything I use is a loaded image. This is a loaded image. As a matter of fact, if you, I go back further in my Please heritage, um, Greek goddess, actually Flora, okay, um, uh, is the uh, the uh, uh, Italian name for it, but uh, what she did is turn people into flowers. Adonis, wounded by a wild boar, his blood dripping down, turns into a rose, and the rose vine grows and engulfs him. So, uh, you know, they started with blood. <laughs> and uh, supposedly the initial... You're so the, cheerful. <laughs> You're so gory. See, it sounds very cheery to me. I know, it probably... It's, well, yeah, it's, I, I love this stuff, mm-hmm. though, because it's all about... Well, it's all about life. I mean, a lot of people think it sounds like it's about Well, that's because death, me- but what's the difference? Is the remembrance death. of death. That's right. literally what it means. Right, which is something for the living to do, right? Exactly. So yeah. it's sort of more like yeah. that. Okay, so how long has it been since you've had a solo show in a, in a Los Angeles gallery? Because in a Los Angeles I gallery, I apologize yeah. if I've missed something, but I feel like it's been a while. Well, yeah. it, it actually has, I'm afraid to say it's been a while, but 2005 was the last solo show in a commercial gallery. That's there have a been while. a number of other shows. Well, I don't Co- crazy. Co- no, 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 college shows. But, yeah. You know, up until then, I was used to doing, you know, you do a solo show once or twice a year somewhere. Sure. Yeah. So this was, this was different for me. A lot of group shows, and these pieces uh, have been, deve- How gave me time to develop. So this particular series, I've been working over the past two years. Okay. And while I've shown Rose images, not like these. Not like these. So these I've just been painting, hanging on to. So th- this is different. And the gallery a small gallery, mm-hmm. so it kind of lends it's itself to this. It's bigger than it looks. I recently discovered because you just curated a show. <laughs> well, I did, and we were. But the point is, we fit a lot of more work in there without it seeming crowded. Than I really. It was almost like some kind of magic where it's bigger on the inside. It's an interesting it, thing about it, space. Yeah. When it's empty, you would think it would seem the biggest. Yeah. But it's really the opposite. It when is, you start to put things in it, you start to realize because yeah. it grows. No, it's, a, it's a lovely space. I mean, because what's nice is you can really get, you can really surround people with these in that sort of space. You know, they can be in the center of the room and kind of just be in and Yeah, in it's it. kind of nice. And that, that's one yeah. thing I, I wanted, a real controlled, smaller space for these. So uh, let me ask you about, so you're going to install them, I'm guessing, sort of like this, right? Eye level, straight line. That's the idea. Not too jammed up like, yeah. well, like these. these Farther apart. The studio, yeah. But um, let me ask you a little bit about the sort of, I don't want to say repetition because within about a second you realize that they are in fact all different. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that kind of um, seriality. Not surreality, but being a series. Because, you know, is it just that the thing that you do to make them is something you want to do more than once, but it just kind of comes out different? Or do you deliberate about choices to make them, you know, the parts that are unique? Well, it's, you know, it's both of that. Going way back, Going I back. really come from. I come from you know a time way of you know Adonis. Before that, exactly. <laughs> uh, I come out of a time where serial imagery is what was happening, and the idea where you take something and you do something to it. This is what Jasper John said. And you do something else to it. And you do something else to it. Uh, there is, you learn how much is in the imagery that you're using and how alive it can be. And subtle changes are big. And I find when I do something, if it works, I want to do it again right. and put in those ideas that I got from the last painting. So it continues that way until it reaches a point where you know, the life's kind of out of it. Mm. And it just... It, it, it just doesn't work. It's kind of a right. drudge and That's no and new saw. ideas come. Except in this yeah. case, it isn't so much ending as kind of like coming back around. Because you really talking about how yes. it's getting, you're not going to stop. You're actually going to try to do that scary thing of loosening it up a little bit. It, yeah, that, but, but of, that's also kind of a kind of natural, it, it does, but I usually find you don't just stop, at least I don't, don't just stop and make a decision to do a whole new series. 
it's already happening in the series that you're working with. So that's the very thing that you want to take and explore. And that leads to, to the next series. And that's why I think no matter what imagery I'm using in my work or stylistically how I'm painting it, it all holds together. At least I see it that way. Yeah. No, it, there's, well, that's, you know, as a writer, I'm very attracted, like I said, to work where I'm allowed to talk about narrative symbolism and I'm allowed to say things like, what does that mean? Because it's like obvious that it means something. Right? And that sounds like such a simple idea, but really think about how a lot of cont modern contemporary art, and not like how artists are, but I mean, you know, there's, that's not the prevailing kind of zeitgeist. That's too romantic with a capital R. It's not, you know, sort of like blase. It's not laissez faire. It's kind of like, it doesn't, why does it have to mean everything? I'm rebelling against, you know, this tyranny of narrative. And it's like, well, okay, you do that. I mean, that's cool. A lot of gorgeous work rebels against, you know, but just for me as a person, not me as an art critic evaluating, but just me as a viewer, I love that thing. I don't think of, you know, they used to call literary, it was kind of like an insult if you'd say someone's painting was literary because it meant you had to read all the stuff into it. I yes. love that. And that's one of the reasons I'm a fan of, of your work. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit just about that dynamic, you know, just as you've noticed it um, over the series. And the reason I'm kind of happy to delve into the past a little bit and sort of talk about the then versus now is because the other place that your work can be seen up in LA right now is a Pacific Standard Time show. <laughs> and so there, that's also happening right now for you. So I'm wondering if you could just kind of... Well, there's a comment. specific standard time show where figurative, early figurative work of mine is going to be shown at the Pasadena Museum yes. of California Art, Michael Duncan's Fantastic LA Museum, Raw by the way. show. Big plugs for the PMCA. I love that museum. They Strange do, museum. It is but weird it's and small right. and in Pasadena. <laughs> the owners live upstairs. But I, I, it's, it's one of my favorite museums in yeah, Los Angeles. It, they do just terrific show after terrific it's, show. It's so. a great spot. So that's so Michael Duncan curated it, and you're, that's is that the only yeah. Pacific Standard Time show? I mean, I'm asking some people are in a couple. That's that's the only official. That's okay. <laughs> right. There's there, there's some other things going on. Um, so in terms of that Pacific Standard Time, looking at that era, you were here for what was then the first. I came here. In 1970, I was in the first graduate class at Cal Arts. Oh my God! Every the first one. The first one. Okay. Friends of mine went back to New York to become internationally famous, and I, <laughs> from Philadelphia, came out here. And after the horrors and wonderful things and horrible things at Cal Arts those first two years, I invested so much of myself. I said, you know, LA needs. An East Coast painter sensibility. It sounds like a crazy thing to say, but the art world was so much smaller then. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought I had something going here, and I wanted to make something happen here. It was the new world for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I stayed, and everything that I planned actually happened here. It was wonderful. So when I finally did get back to New York, I made it just in time for the recession. <laughs> so the time for that was slightly off, but I wouldn't change things. The New York experience, I also made it in time to have a studio and an apartment in Manhattan. I think one of the last chances for an artist that is a not making millions. A distant memory. To, yes, yeah, it was. it's still there though. I like to get rid of it because it's it's painful. Also, downtown Los Angeles, I had a nine thousand square foot studio for three hundred sixty dollars a month. I don't even I'd like to forget that. Nine thousand square feet. What does that even mean? B bigger than you'd ever want. Like, can you even see had, to the other? I had a friend who used to come down and just skateboard in it. <laughs> you know, it was it was ridiculous, but it was also terrific too. And so you're so, back in downtown yeah. now, and I mean, it's just I love the sort of um, kind of pattern of it. You know, it's like you're doing the new work, but it's edging towards the old work, and then the old work is being brought, you know, back in, out for you know for people to meet. I mean, the Pacific Standard Time shows, whatever you think of the scholarship or the sprawling nature of it, the most exciting part is getting to see this work in person, either again or for the first time because yeah. it's work you've seen reproduced it's all these people that we know what they did in 1970 but not that many people were going to the right gallery the one month in 1970 I mean in other words yeah. and we get to see it in person and, and, and that's exciting. I, I, I forget that right so when people 
mention just that, that they've seen this work for the first time, the like actual works. Yeah. I just kind of take it for granted. Doesn't everybody know? Of course no. not. What Michael Duncan is doing to L.A. Raw, it's a figurative show. As a matter of fact, he wanted a big figurative piece for me, and I said, Michael, that actually started in 82, those big pieces. Can't you stretch it? No. He, he's, he was he stuck with that 45 to not 1980, so my figures are, are smaller than that. But I don't know of another show that's really concentrating on the figure. Yeah. And he's doing something that would be unheard of just not too long ago, and that's starting with Rico Lebrun, a name that when I first came out to Los Angeles, you could not mention this figurative painter who related to the Mexican muralists, kind of, a, kind of a cubist too, big crucifixes and all. I mean, I kind of love the talk about overly romantic right. and operatic. That was Rico Lebrun, but he's starting with him. It's a courageous thing to do and tracing the figure through Los Angeles. It gets weird. forgotten. And with a lot of the really great looking work from the Venice crew that you mm -hmm. see so much now, especially at the Getty show, uh, you can understand mm -hmm. why. But I'm really interested in this show that, that Michael is doing. And yeah, even though I call myself an abstract painter, I do need an image to work in and around. So you're not painting a rose in the same way that somebody might paint a still life of roses as a study or because no. that's what's there. It's, it's not just any flower. It's not just any kind of really, it's not just anything nat you know, natural. It's a red rose. It's r and and it, the red part is also you know, right. really and important so too. That, when I say literary, I mean like there's a whole history, like, you know, look this up in the dream symbol books, like all the places that you would go I, to find. I, I hope, and I guess I kind of assume that people know that behind any, and I always paint an image, a single image, because the story is there. I think that's how we deal with the world. It's just you dealing with everything. <laughs> so when it gets right down to it, one image should suffice, because the whole story is there. Or one at a time. Uh, yeah. yeah, that you can oh, yes, put one everything at a time, into yeah. it. Yeah. So, you know, I think the rose, you know, it's kind of like fraught, I guess, would be the word. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it comes with this kind of baggage and not in a bad way, in a, in a good way, because it creates this whole kind of backstory of, you know, having so many different kinds of overlapping meanings and, you know, that all different kinds of people would have an association with and all that kind of stuff. And I, yes, and I, it's this wonderful image. I, I think that... It's, it's also an image that, and I think every painting is about, you know, what you know. Um, well, and that could be to, along with, it also has to include what, what you yearn for. It's like a very sensual experience. Well, those are things that people carry around with them sort of anyway. And so you as an artist, yeah. you're, like, you're, you're on board with that. It's like, bring me your emotional baggage, bring your history and your memory and just like look at this rose and just, you know, let it mean whatever it's going to mean to you, but knowing that it's going to be a meaningful, it's not like, it's not an iris where maybe 48% of the people in the world wouldn't even be 100% sure it was called an iris, much less do they, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, they exactly, don't carry yeah. a, a, it doesn't evoke no, no, anything this, but they see, go. But the rose is... At, you know, it could be everything in art, out of art, Bible, romance. Romance, life, death, and now we're back to opera. And, and yeah. opera, excellent. Okay, um, I guess, uh, I'm not sure because we had the little time snafu. Do we have another minute? Okay, post-production is my favorite thing. <laughs> so, um, if you would mind, tell, uh, tell the story, because I think it's kind of funny, how you uh, actually started working with the good folks at the Garbushian Gallery to do this show. Herar and his partner, his wife, Lori Garbushian, um, I, who are really refreshing. They are Because wonderful. they come into the art world differently than a lot of art dealers and, uh, and other people involved in, in the art world. And uh, he also had a business, Herar Garbushian, for... I don't even really want to he's, say how many years. He's a self-made man. And the gallery is where it is because that's where he ran his business. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's small and, and it is... No, but you're right. They came to it from this place of love. I mean, they're hardcore collectors. And I can't, I can't help it. Garbushian Gallery is a half a block south of Gagosian Gallery. I know. So I think the Armenians are probably taking over I think they Beverly are. Hills I see it all the time. And half the time people will come in and they'll look around. They get this really confused look on their face. And you can tell in their minds they're thinking, I thought... Gagosian would be 
much bigger. <laughs> no, I think it's cross street. The box there. <laughs> well, that that's good and bad, but I think it's fun. And, and they're such wonderful there. to work with. And he's, he's doing, he's really doing well. great. And the reason I ask is because I know he's a fan of your work, and that's how it. That's, that's how, how it met. started. So we met because there was an auction, mm -hmm. a Robert Berman auction, and uh, work of mine from um, a corporate collection. Actually, all the work in this auction came from a particular corporate collection. Oh, I see. So everyone there. And it was a great corporate collection. In the good old days when they bought from me a, a big show. double crucifix painting. So, I mean, who wants that? And I in thought. In their corporate. In their corporate. That would never collection. happen. It wouldn't happen today. Never. Wow. No, uh, I had lots of work like that in the 80s being bought, <laughs> and it stayed um, on view for, you know, 25 years. 80s were so, awesome. Sorry, they were. They were. <laughs> Art-wise, when in everyone thought that they were wealthy and felt that they needed an art collection, it gave a lot of license to artists That's to do what they really wanted to do. It was wonderful. But so this poor corporation, who can remain nameless if you want, had to deaccession everything or explode Nestle, it. Or explode Nestle, it was the Nestle, Nestle. Nestle collection. That's I don't know why they got rid of it, but they, they, I don't know if they were moving or anything. It was in Glendale. And tours came through, that's but like they the decided random. that's that, so the whole thing went. I don't even understand anything about that sentence. It's like, my big crucifix paintings at the Nestle headquarters <laughs> in Glendale. Like, I know, it doesn't <laughs> make... I don't even know what that means. Okay. It, so it was Carnation Company that actually bought it. It's milk and crucifix. Well, they go together, of course. Or Carnation. So you should have done Carnation. <laughs> You know, today I probably would have thought of that, but I don't think. I, I, don't, myself I don't think. That. Okay, so we're running out of time, but so basically, okay, you're cracking me up too. You don't have to but, tell the whole story, but okay, basically, but, but, just you, he was there at this auction where your piece was being sold. No, I, I, and I because will say this, wanted, I went to the auction because I thought there was a low estimate on my piece, and I told Robert Berman, what's the deal here? I'm going to go and buy that doggone thing back. I don't yeah. mind saying that, so I went there, but to my surprise, there was a bidding war that started, and I just kind of, you know, Very watched nice. it happen, and the guy who ended up with the piece turned out to be Harar Garbushian. I was leaving because I was satisfied, okay, the piece was dealt with with respect. Now I can get the heck out of here because I don't like being at those auctions anyway. Someone's going to see me. Yeah. But I said, this is a huge double crucifix piece. Who would buy that today? I've got to meet this guy. So I, I go up and I introduce myself. He introduces himself as Harar Garbushian. He says, that, that is Christ on the cross, isn't it? And I said, yes, that's, you know, that's what it is. And, uh, and he said, I'm Armenian. I said, well, okay, so you you understand all of this. The heritage is almost the, exactly the same. He was a delightful guy. He said, let's get together sometime. We did. And that's how it all and started. And he's and he, and very enthusiastic. Yeah, no, he's a huge fan. And he's yeah. so excited about showing these paintings. So Yeah, no, I'm January excited about this show. 28th. It opens on the 28th, runs through February into the first week of March. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much for speaking Shana, with us today. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Everyone out there in TV and internet land, January 28th at Garbushi and Gallery Beverly Hills. Come see these fabulous paintings in person for yourself. Thanks and good night. <laughs>